Evaporation, um, also called vaporization, is the physical change where something goes from a liquid into a gas. And the rate of vaporization um, is going to depend on a, a couple of things. Uh, we can make the vaporization occur faster by increasing the surface area, by increasing the temperature, or by decreasing the strength of the intermolecular forces. So if you think about um, maybe drying your hands, right? So you wash your hands after you use the bathroom, right? Everybody does that? You wash your hands, and there's no paper towels. There's just one of those stupid air dryers, right? So to get your hands to dry faster, you can rub them together, which is going to spread the water out and increase the surface area. That's going to help them dry faster. Putting your hands under the blower, especially if the blower has warm air instead of cold air, the warm air makes your hands dry faster. That's why a, a clothes dryer has heat in it to heat up the clothes and cause the evaporation to go faster. Intermolecular forces also affect the rate of evaporation. Um, if you've ever used the uh, the hand sanitizer in the little bottle. You notice that that like, evaporates very quickly off of your hands, right? Because most of that contains alcohol. Alcohol has lower strength of intermolecular forces, so it evaporates more easily than water does. And if you get oil on your hands, is that going to evaporate? Not in my lifetime. Oil has stronger intermolecular forces that do not allow it to evaporate, OK? So we have two terms here, volatile and non-volatile. Volatile is a liquid that will evaporate easily. Non-volatile does not vaporize easily. So here we have an illustration of a beaker of water. The molecules on the interior of this, like we talked about, have more interactions with other particles. So they're held more strongly. The ones on the surface are held less strongly because they have fewer interactions. There's one side of this where there's no interactions. We need to remember that although the temperature is related to the kinetic energy, the movement of the particles, it's related to the average kinetic energy. Not all the particles have the same kinetic energy. Some have higher energy and some have lower energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So if you have high kinetic energy molecules that are near the surface, they can break away from the interactions around them and escape into the gas state. The higher the energy of these particles, the faster they will escape into the gas state. I think of this as um, playing Red Rover. Have you guys played the game Red Rover? This means yes. This means no, never heard of it. OK, so Red Rover, you get two groups of children. They don't let them do this in school anymore because somebody could hurt themselves, right? You get two, two groups of children on opposite sides of a field, and they, they form two lines holding hands. And then one line, somebody yells out, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Sally right over. So Sally has to run across the field and try to run through this line of children holding hands with their arms outstretched. So, you know, if you know your classmates, you pick the weaker ones or the ones who are afraid of pain, right? And you go for that. You don't go between the big bully boys who are, you know, well, they're probably not next to each other holding hands anyway, but you get the idea. So I think of this as there's a red rover line here, and these water molecules are trying to get through it. So the faster molecules can break through. If you walk up to the line and just press against their hands, you're probably not going to make it through. Your best chance is to run very quickly. I always get ahead of myself. So here's a graph, fraction of molecules versus kinetic energy. So if we like surveyed all the molecules in a glass of water, we'd find that some of them have very low kinetic energy, some of them have very high kinetic energy, and it forms generally a bell curve. And so here's you know, more of an average. So most of them are here in this middle. But some of them have high energy. This dashed line here 
is the minimum kinetic energy needed to break through the Red Rover line to escape from the liquid water. On the blue line here, some of those water molecules have enough energy to escape. If they get to the surface, they can escape. If they're stuck in the middle, they can't. That's why increasing the surface area increases how fast the water evaporates. You think about a glass of water on the counter or a glass of water spilled on the floor. Which will evaporate faster? The one on the floor because it has larger surface area. The particles have to get to the surface in order to be able to evaporate. So this is at a low temperature. If we increase the temperature of the water, the average kinetic energy increases, and the curve shifts over like this. This is the red line, higher temperature. We see at higher temperature now, we have more molecules that have enough kinetic energy to escape. And so the water will evaporate more quickly. So these are things that you know from personal experience with water. Water that's spread out will evaporate faster than water that is in you know, something with a small surface area. Water that's warm will evaporate faster than water that's cold. This is explaining why that is. Any questions? Condensation is the opposite of evaporation. It's going from, no, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. <sighs> Condensation is the opposite. It's going from a gas to a, a liquid. Um, if we have a situation more where the rates, bless you, of condensation and evaporation are equal, we can have a dynamic equilibrium where molecules are escaping into the gas state, but they are also uh, condensing back into the liquid state. And when that occurs, we get a vapor pressure of the liquid. We, we talked about and dealt with vapor pressure in lab yesterday. Yes? So is this like the morning dew kind of thing? Uh, the condensation is the morning dew, yes. So you get up in the morning and the grass is wet and it's not because the sprinklers went off, right? It's because as there is water in the air, we call it humidity, and when you get to a low enough temperature, the dew point, then the water condenses onto the grass because it's cooling down. It doesn't have enough kinetic energy to stay in the air. Good question. So the vapor pressure is going to be the partial pressure of whatever liquid we're talking about in equilibrium with its liquid. So we have to have a picture to talk about this. So let's think about this. So here we have an Erlenmeyer flask, and we put some water in here, and we put a stopper on this. What happens initially is there's evaporation occurring. There aren't any water molecules up here, at least not in the illustration, and so nothing can condense, but water will begin to evaporate because there are some molecules in here that have enough energy to escape, and when they get close to the surface, they will. So we have evaporation only. As evaporation continues, we get some gas molecules up here. And what do gases do? They travel in straight lines till they run into something. So these guys are going to bounce off the walls, maybe bounce off the stopper. But eventually, they're going to hit the surface of the water. Then they get stuck again. That's condensation. So we have particles getting stuck, and we have particles escaping. As the concentration or the number of gas particles increases, the rate of condensation is going to increase. The rate of evaporation is dependent on the surface area and the temperature. That's not going to, going to change at all. So at some point, we're going to get to a point where the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are the same. Because the number of gas molecules in that space is relatively constant. These are not the same gas molecules all the time. New ones are coming to the gas state, and old ones are bouncing around and colliding and getting stuck. It's a little bit like, say, an air, airport, where you have people arriving on flights and people leaving on flights. And if you counted the number of people in the airport, it's probably relatively constant, but it's different people, right? Because some are coming and some are going. 
That's what's going on here. It's called a dynamic equilibrium. So it looks like nothing's happening, but there's actually evaporation and condensation. So if we have a gas, the gas exerts a pressure, right? That's what gases do. So there is a pressure from the water in this space, and that's called the vapor pressure of water. Vapor pressure will increase if we have increasing temperature or if the intermolecular forces are weaker. Um, the vapor pressure is independent of the surface area because if you increase the surface area, maybe you make this um, spread out more, uh, a shorter, wider dish, um, the rate of condensation is also dependent on the surface area. More surface area, more particles hitting it and getting trapped. It's dependent on the temperature and on the strength of the intermolecular forces. What happens when water boils? The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid is equal to the atmospheric pressure above it. So when this happens, the, the water molecules are energetic enough that they will actually form little pockets of gas deep inside the water. We observe those as bubbles. Bubbles are areas of gas inside of a liquid. They are less dense than the liquid, so they rise to the surface and pop, and who knows what happens then? They, well, they go off until they run into something. So when you heat the water up high, hot enough, it will begin to boil. So the vapor pressure at this higher temperature is the same as atmospheric pressure above it. I don't want to go that well. Sometimes I, I, I teach two different levels and I forget what's coming next. Um, have you heard of a pressure cooker? Why, why do people use pressure cookers? To cook the food faster, right? So we'll get to why you can cook food faster in a pressure cooker in a minute. Um, once you get to the boiling point of the liquid, more heating does not make the temperature of the water any hotter. Boiling water on the stove, whether it's been sitting there for two minutes or ten minutes, is the same temperature. Doesn't matter how high you turn it up, you can make it boil faster or boil slower, we call that simmering, but the temperature of the water is the same. It's going to be about 100 degrees Celsius. After all the water has boiled away, then your pot will get hotter, right? And it'll start to smoke and burn and you'll have a mess on your hands. So what we observe is you take water at room at you know 20 degrees and you add heat to it. The temperature rises. We are increasing the kinetic energy of these water molecules. Once we get to 100 degrees Celsius, because as we're increasing this temperature, the vapor pressure of the water is increasing. Yeah. So would the boiling point change if you would be at the same to the boiling point changes if you change the pressure. Yep. So once we get up to 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is equal to atmospheric pressure. Bubbles will form inside the water and it boils. And it will more rapidly convert into the gas state. It will continue at 100 degrees Celsius until all the water has converted into the gas state. Because what's happening here is, as the water boils, it's the more energetic particles that are leaving. The temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles. So if you've got an average kinetic energy, and you're putting more heat in, but all the more energetic ones are leaving, the average stays the same. You're putting heat in, but the energetic ones are leaving. So the temperature stays the same until they've all converted into the gas state. Then the temperature will go up. Um, yeah, this is the, the, um, the transition between, um, sorry, liquid and gas, yes. 
Um, evaporation, um, we tend to think of evaporation as happening, happening slower at a lower temperature, but evaporation is a transition between a gas, a liquid and a gas. So if you're boiling uh, water in a, in a beaker with a stopper on it, and it turns into gas, if you were to cool that beaker, would the beaker send back the tin water? Or? That's a good question. So if you had, if you had a container that was closed and you boiled the water, so what would happen is it would, it would really depend on the container. If you just had a stopper in an Erlenmeyer flask, as you begin to boil the water, you get a lot more water in the gas state, and that's going to generate a lot of pressure, and it's probably going to shoot that cork up to the ceiling. If you boiled the water and the container was able to hold the pressure and not explode, and then you cooled it, yes, that water would condense back down into the liquid. It's just not getting to what I want. So we said that the, um, the vapor pressure of, of a liquid um, increases as you increase the temperature. And the boiling point is where the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So if we increase the atmospheric pressure, then we can cause the water to boil at a higher temperature. So in, you know, when you're cooking food in water, the highest temperature you can get is 100 degrees Celsius. If you use a pressure cooker, you can get to a higher temperature, maybe 110 degrees, and that's going to cause the food to cook faster. When you fry food, it cooks faster because oil has a much higher boiling point. And so you can get the oil up to like 300 degrees Celsius and throw chicken or french fries in there, and it'll cook very quickly because the temperature's higher. When you're dealing with boiling water, boiling anything, the temperature is limited to 100 degrees Celsius unless you have a pressure cooker. The reverse is true. If you reverse, if you reduce the atmospheric pressure, you reduce the temperature at which water boils. If you have a strong enough vacuum, you can get water to boil at room temperature. It's, you know, I don't remember a lot from high school, but there's these little snapshots I remember. And one of them is from chemistry class, where my teacher, Mr. Sturdivant, we called him Crazy Floyd, but um, had a big vacuum flask on the counter in the front with water in it, and he started up a vacuum pump, and he began lecturing. And after a while, the water started to boil. There was no hot plate. There was nothing hidden under the bench. The water started to boil. And then he made us all come up and touch it. And the first person was like, I'm not touching boiling water. But what do you do? Teacher says, touch the flask. You touch the flask, right? It was the same temperature as the bench. It was room temperature, and the water was boiling. And I was just blown away. I'm like, that is so cool. Maybe that's why I became a chemist. I don't know. But it's really cool. I don't know if you've noticed on um, like a cake mix, there's high altitude instructions. If you're, you know, if you're living up at Hume Lake for the summer and you want to bake a cake, you're going to have to adjust your baking times because at that higher elevation, water boils at a slightly lower temperature. So it's going to take longer to bake the cake. It's going to take longer to cook your spaghetti because the water will not get as hot. Any questions? So evaporation is endothermic. It absorbs heat because the energy needed to break those molecules away from each other um, requires an input of heat. That's why when we sweat, it cools us off. And a breeze will intensify the cooling effect. Hence my little friend, the fan down here. Um, if you have high humidity, if there's a lot of water present in the air already, that's going to slow down the rate of evaporation and prevent cooling. So I grew up in the Midwest where we had pretty high humidity. The day my husband and I got married, it was 95 degrees and 95% humidity. It was like a sauna, right? go outside and your body sweats because it's hot, 
And evaporation doesn't work very well, so you just sweat like a pig, and nothing really happens except you get really wet. Uh, it doesn't cool you off. Here, where we have, I think, a, a really nice level of humidity, um, you know, you get a little breeze, a little bit of sweat, and it's cooling, and you're like, oh, okay, I can deal with the rest of the day. It's because as the, the breeze comes, it helps those molecules to move away, and they take energy with them. So evaporation is endothermic. We can also think of that as, well, how do you get water to evaporate faster? You heat it up, right? You put heat into it. Condensation is the opposite of evaporation. Condensation is exothermic. It releases heat. And so this is one that's a little harder to um, get your mind around. I think the best way to remember it is evaporation is endothermic. It takes energy. Condensation is the opposite. So it must release energy. Um, steam can cause a really bad burn because as those water molecules that are in the steam in the gas state condense onto your hand or your skin, they release energy and cause your skin to be very hot and to burn. This endothermic, exothermic, evaporation, condensation thing that water does is part of what moderates our climate. Um, here in the Central Valley of California, where the humidity is, is quite low, we have huge temperature fluctuations from the high of the day, which, you know, in the summer could be 106, but then it might get down to 66 that night, right? That's not unusual. It's, it's wonderful, in fact. There are other times where it was 100 during the day and it only gets down to 80. Those are the days when the humidity is higher. Because as the air cools down and the water begins to condense on the grass and form dew, it releases energy and it keeps the air warm. In the Midwest, in the summer, the temperature changes are more like 10 degrees. You know, it was 85 during the day and maybe it cools down to 75 at night and it's just it's icky. It's icky. There's some awesome things about the Midwest, but that's not one of them. Well, if there's heat involved, we're going to want to measure it, right? So heat of vaporization is um, indicated as delta H, VAP, for vaporization. That's the amount of heat needed to vaporize or evaporate one mole of liquid. So for water, at its normal boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, that is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. You do not need to memorize that number. So we can write this as a chemical equation and say H2O liquid going to H2O gas, that the enthalpy or heat involved is 40.7 kilojoules. When it's written this way, this is kilojoules per molar amounts as written in the equation. So here it's one mole, so this is per one mole. It's positive because it's an endothermic process. You have to put the energy into it to have this happen. The opposite, water condensing from the gas to the liquid, energy cannot be created or, or destroyed, and so you can't make energy or lose energy by causing water to evaporate and condense over and over and over again. The same amount of energy that you put in gets released. So when the gas condenses into a liquid, it's the same amount of energy per mole. It's just that it's going in the opposite direction. We can use heat of vaporization as a conversion factor to find out how much heat is needed to vaporize or condense a given amount of liquid. So, like I said, you don't need to memorize these. You'd be given the information you need. Um, here's a table that shows uh, water, rubbing alcohol, acetone, and diethyl ether. Here's the heat of vaporization at the boiling point. Here's the heat of vaporization at 25 degrees Celsius. These numbers are somewhat different, so you do need to pay attention to the temperature. So let's do a calculation with this. Uh, calculate the amount of heat in kilojoules required to vaporize 2.58 kilograms of water at its boiling point. 
the heat of vaporization is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So let's write down what we have here. 2.58 kilograms of water, and then we've got 40.7 kilojoules per mole. And we want to find kilojoules. So we want to end up with kilojoules. We've got two numbers given. We have to figure out which one is our starting number, which is our conversion factor. Well, this one, kilojoules per mole, any time you get the units something per something, that's most likely your conversion factor. Here, this is a single unit. You can't use that to convert anything. So this is what we're starting with. And then we have to find a path from kilograms to kilojoules. And since they gave us this number, we're probably going to need to use that, right? So just off the top of my head, I don't know a relationship between kilograms of water and kilojoules. But looking at this, we see that if we start at the end and work our way backwards, what unit should we put here? <coughs> Well, we have kilojoules, and what does this relate kilojoules to? Moles. So if I have moles right before kilojoules, I can use this to get from moles to kilojoules, right? Um, and then we've got, we need to bridge this gap, moles and kilograms. Well, what have we hopefully become very good at converting what to moles? Grams to moles. So if we put grams in here, we can do the molar mass, and we could do that. Oh, could we do kilograms to grams? Sure. We just need to know what the K stands for. So there's our path. Yes? If it's harder to go backwards, so it's to go forward? Yes. You can go forwards or backwards. You can start at both ends and meet in the middle. The process is not as important as just coming up with the final path. Sometimes students think they have to start at the beginning and they don't know where to go, and they get stuck, and they quit. And so that's, that's not helpful, right? So if, if starting at the beginning doesn't work, try starting from the end and working backwards. Um, I understand that these problems are challenging for many of you, but you all have the intelligence to solve them. A lot of it comes down to determination thinking maybe a little outside the box, um, looking for different resources, asking for help, just being persistent, okay? And even though chemistry may be something that, well, for some of you, you may never use again in your life, right? There are things that you can learn about yourself and about how to approach life from being forced to study chemistry. I mean, I, you know, I went to graduate school and... Um, do I actually use the chemistry that I learned in graduate school? Not really. But I learned a lot about myself and about what I'm capable of in graduate school, and I got a lot of confidence from that. And so there's a lot of things in this class that you can learn that will help you in life, even though it's not related to chemistry. So I'll get off the soapbox now, and we'll solve this problem. So there's our our path. Once we've got the path, we follow the path. So 2.58 kilograms of water. Let's just put that in there. I look at my path. I see three arrows. That means I need three lines for three conversion factors. The units here go in the numerator. Kilograms to grams to moles to kilojoules. I know I keep saying the same thing over and over again, but I'm pretty sure there's some people that still it just has not clicked yet. So I'm hoping that if, if I say it over and over and over again, that maybe something will stick. So kilograms to grams to moles to kilojoules. Kilograms to grams to moles to kilojoules. Um, this unit comes down here. Kilograms of water. Um, grams comes down here. Moles comes down here. In this problem, we are not uh, dealing with a chemical reaction. We're dealing with a physical change. So all of this is related to the water. 
So we don't have to write H2O here like we do in stoichiometry. So then, you know, pick whichever one you want to do first. I'm going to do this one first. Kilojoules to moles. That's this guy right here that was given to us in the problem. So 40.7 kilojoules are needed for every mole of water. And moles to grams, that's the molar mass. So you calculate the molar mass of water, and you come up with 18.016. And kilograms and grams. And people are still having trouble with this. So K, kilo means what? 10 to the 3. So I have kilo in the denominator, and I have grams in the numerator. And so I put kilo on the uh, kilos here, and I put what it means over there. Don't ever write 10 to the third kilograms. A gram is a very small amount. Five grams is the, the mass of a nickel, okay? Very, very small. A kilogram is a little over two pounds. So could one gram be equal to 1,000 kilograms? No, 1,000 kilograms is basically a ton. So when you do these, if you find yourself getting them wrong, stop and think about them. So 1 times 10 to the third grams is 1 kilogram. So 2.58 times 1 EE3 divided by 18.016. Oh, I missed the one. Times 40.7. So my calculator is showing me a bunch of numbers like it often does. When I look at this problem, this has three significant figures, three significant figures. So my answer is going to have three significant figures. I'm going to write down two extras um, just to avoid rounding errors. So the 8 is in the 1's place, the 2 is in the 10's place. Some of you are great at rounding numbers like this, and you'll say, yeah, that's 5,830. Others of you are not so great at it. That's okay, we can work around that. But please don't tell me that 5,828 is the same as 583. So if you have trouble with this, anytime you're rounding to the left of that first place, the 1's place, Put it in scientific notation and then round it. So one, two, three. So 5.8. I want to keep this place where the two is, but I need to round it up. So I put a three there. And I've moved the decimal point three places. It's a large number. It's a positive exponent. So that's a good answer. 5830 is an okay answer as well. Yes? Um, I have a question. How does scientific chemistry would mark me wrong if I didn't put it in scientific notation? Would it look like that? Does it always have to be in scientific notation? Um, if it says use scientific notation, it would. Um, sometimes we end up with a zero that is supposed to be significant but isn't. Um, mastering chemistry can be, as you know, extremely picky about stuff. Yeah, which is another lesson because, you know, you might have a boss someday that's really, really picky, you know. So how do you get along with them? You figure out what they want and you give it to them, right? So mastering chemistry, figure out what it wants and do your best to give it to it. Here's another one. Drop of water weighing 0.48 grams condenses on the surface of a 55 gram block of aluminum that is initially at 25 degrees Celsius. If the heat released during condensation goes only toward heating the metal, what is the final temperature in Celsius of the metal block? The specific heat capacity of aluminum is 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius. This is a more involved problem. You might need a picture for this, so I'm going to draw um, a bad picture for you. This is the only kind I can draw. So here's, um, here's our block of aluminum. Aluminum is, you know, kind of gray. So there's our block of aluminum. It weighs 55 grams. We know that. Um, 
aluminum. Um, we're told that its specific heat capacity is 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then there's this drop of water. So here's our drop of water, big, big drop of water, just so we can see it. It kind of looks like a drop of water. Um, Matt has a mass of 0.48 grams. Um, what else do we know about the aluminum? It's initially at 25 degrees Celsius. So it's at 25 degrees Celsius. So when the water condenses, this isn't water just a droplet falling, but it's condensing on it from the air. Condensation is exothermic. It's releasing energy. Could we calculate how much energy 0.48 grams of water condensing releases? And you're thinking, I'm sure we could, but I don't know how to do that. It's okay. The answer is yes, we can. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Bob the Builder, sorry. Um, here's water. The heat of vaporization of water at the boiling point is 40.7. Are we at the boiling point here? No, we're at 25 degrees Celsius. This is a number that we'd have to go look up. They didn't give it to us in the problem. On an exam, I'd give it to you. 44 kilojoules per mole is what's released at 25 degrees Celsius. So delta H is um, 44, <clears throat> excuse me, 0 0.0 kilojoules per mole the water. <coughs> so we have water condensing, it's releasing energy, it's releasing heat. When you put heat into a block of metal, it causes the temperature to go up. We're not going to worry about that just yet. We're going to see how much water, how much heat does the water release. This is similar to the calculation we just did. Here we have 0 0.48 grams of water and we want to know how much heat is released. So we could do kilojoules, right? So we could get kilojoules of energy. We looked up the heat of vaporization, uh, 40, 44 kilojoules per mole. So if we have mole in the middle here, we could get to kilojoules, and we can get from grams to moles. Very similar, it's just we're starting with gram instead of kilogram. <coughs> mm. So 0.48 grams of water times, uh, we're going to have mole here and grams in the denominator, so the grams cancel. And the second arrow will have kilojoules on top and moles on the bottom. 44 kilojoules per mole, so 44.0 kilojoules per one mole. This will be the molar mass of water. So we got 0.48 divided by 18.016 times 44. One point one seven two kilojoules of energy. So as that water condenses, it releases 1.172 kilojoules of energy. Any questions? That energy, we're said, um, assume if, not assume, if the heat released during condensation goes only toward heating the metal, what's the final temperature? Do you remember doing calculations like that? We had a final temperature, we had an initial temperature. We had specific heat capacity, MC delta T.
This is not the end of the problem yet. We've got another step here. So Q equals MC delta T. The heat is equal to the mass of the substance times its specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. What we want is that change in temperature. We know the initial temperature. If we know the change, then we can figure out what the final temperature is. So delta T is going to equal Q divided by MC. Let's think ahead a little bit here. This is um, joules, and this is kilojoules. If we want our units to work out, we need to convert this to joules. <coughs> um, I'll do that up here, way up at the top. So 1.1724. Where did I get the 4? There's no 4. 1.172 kilojoules times, I want joules on top and kilojoules on the bottom. Kilo means 10 to the 3. I put kilo on the opposite side of the line. So I end up with 1.172 times 10 to the 3rd kilojoules. Uh, So now I've got the numbers I need to plug into this equation down here. 1.172 times 10 to the third joules divided by the mass of the aluminum block, 55 grams, and divided by the specific heat capacity, which was given 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius. What is that? That's that equation you're supposed to know. This was, um, do you remember when we did the styrofoam cups and we mixed stuff in them and we measured the temperature changes? Yeah. So that was heat transfer between things. So when you put heat into something, the temperature goes up. And this is the equation that gives the relationship there. If you have more heat, the temperature is going to go up higher. If you have a smaller... Um, amount of something and you put the same amount of heat in, it's going to heat up more. And then the specific heat capacity tells us how, how much it heats up. So we've got that 1.172 times 10 to the third divided by 55 divided by 0 0.903. Our units work out, the joules cancel joules and the grams cancel grams and we're going to end up with degrees Celsius 23, um, this is going to have two sig figs, 23.59 degrees Celsius. Is that the final temperature of the aluminum? No. That's the change in temperature. Because think about it, you, the water condenses, it's putting heat into the aluminum, the temperature should go up, right? If this is the final temperature, it started out at 25, then it went down. So that's not going to work. This is telling us that the temperature increased 23.59 degrees. So we need to add that to the 25. Yes? The little, the little K I got rid of up here. Yeah, that's okay. It's good to ask because things should not just disappear like that. Yeah, it's hiding up here. So I converted the kilojoules to joules before I stuck it into the equation. And and sometimes students will do that. They'll just like, I don't, I don't know what to do with the K, so I'm just not going to write it down. <laughs> well, you can do that, but you're not going to get the right answer. So I'm going to get rid of some of this because I need some space. I wish I could do that with the clutter in my house. Um, 23.59 degrees Celsius is the change. And so the change plus the initial temperature is going to give us uh, 48.59 degrees Celsius. So that would round to 49 degrees Celsius.
So the aluminum is going to heat up. Well, it's, it's endothermic for the aluminum. It's exothermic for the water. Um, I will ask you to identify endothermic and exothermic things, but not in the context of a problem like this. You've got enough to focus on on this one. Any questions? Too many? This is, this is a hard problem for Chem 3A. If, if this is just like too much for you, you could still pass the class. But you should be able to do this step by itself and this step by itself. Putting it together is for A students. Um, if, if you can't put that together, all hope is not lost, okay? You can pass the class and, and if you have to take Chem 1A, I'll teach you how to do that in Chem 1A. Any other questions? Yeah. So, in that problem, that one drop made an increase in that much? I know that seems a little extreme, doesn't it? Yeah. That 0.48 grams of water condensing um, would, would cause the temperature to go up that much. That, that's bothering me, too. It could be that the problem's not set up right. I'm looking, you know, the, the, the question is not uh, reasonable. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I, I don't see that I did anything wrong in the calculation. It, that it, um, yeah, so let's let's elaborate on exactly how are the the temperature things. So delta T, yeah, but let, let's, let's work it out because delta T is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So if we want to rearrange this and get the final temperature, we need to add, yeah. But those are the sorts of things that, especially on a test, your brain can play tricks on you and say, oh, no, I need to subtract that. Well, don't change it unless you can prove it to yourself. You should be able to think about this. This is just adding and subtracting. The other thing that we need to be able to think about is, so this is condensing. We expect the temperature to go up, right? If we're adding energy, the temperature has to go up. So if we do a calculation and it goes down, something's wrong somewhere. If you've got all your work written out, you can go back and look and see, check everything. Questions? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. 